Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Francis Farrell, member of the Faculty of Education. Delighted to welcome you all to our faculty research seminar and a very warm welcome uh, to our speaker today, Dr. Anna Liddell. Anna is a postdoctoral researcher based at Leeds University, currently working on a very important uh, research project called Speaking Citizen, uh, Citizens. Um, I must admit to mention Anna is also an associate lecturer at York University. Um, and in relation to her excellent work on citizenship, I was very pleased to be able to publish her work on fundamental British values and the deliberative democratic classroom in a recent edition of the of the journal Prism. So uh, we'll put the uh, the details in the uh, in the chat, colleagues, uh, if you uh, want to to read that. So really looking forward to today's presentation. Um, Anna will speak for approximately 20 to 25 minutes. Uh, please feel free to post uh, your questions, your observations, comments in the chat, and then we'll have uh, some discussion and some feedback for approximately 30, 25 minutes uh, following uh, Anna's uh, uh, presentation. So uh, without further ado, over to you and a very warm welcome to you, Anna. Great, thank you. Um, thank you for that welcome. And um, I just want to apologise in advance, because I'm just getting over COVID, so I might do a bit of uh, coughing as we go along. So I uh, apologise for that. Um, so what we're going to be covering in today's seminar, um, there we go, um, is we're going to be having a look at um, how war is remembered in schools. And I'm going to talk about a contribution they're making to the um, discussion around this of the term red poppy remembrance discourse. And part of this, I'm going to be talking about how remembrance in schools has um, is militarised and also nationalistic. And it's also very um, uncritically done. And um, I'm going to be touching upon Butler's idea of grievability, who is seen as grievable within this uh, discourse. And I'm also going to explain how this is um, reflective of what Galton calls uh, cultural violence, which I'll explain a bit more in a minute. And this is part of a, a larger discourse. So the argument I'll be making, um, and I'd really like to hear what you think about it afterwards, is that there's a, a discourse within schools called this Red Poppy Remembrance Discourse, and this is part of a larger discourse, and that by continuing to remember in this way, war is sort of seen you know as something that's natural and unavoidable and peacemaking is not part of the dialogue around peacemaking in schools and this also makes a contribution because there is work done on remembrance um in some countries such as cyprus israel palestine where there is recent or, or ongoing conflict but because in britain we're nominally at peace um this is not uh something that is discussed as much. And we'll also like to hear your views on uh, how war should be remembered in school in our in our discussion. Um, a bit of background to the project. Um, this was my PhD work um, entitled How Peace and War Are Taught in Secondary Schools in England During the World War One Centenary Period. And when I say taught, I don't just mean within the, the curriculum, I, I'm arguing that all the messages and the activities of the school are part of, of teaching within the school. And um, this was collected in, in 2016, so it's a while ago now, but within the context of um, the centenary of World War One. And I did an in-depth case study of a, a um, diverse school in Northern England, which um, I gave the student in Alderfield School. And I chose to do that to sort of immerse myself into a school setting and look at different elements that I might not have got to do in, in another setting. Um, so I did focus groups with some young people, interviewed teachers, I did document analysis and um, looked at some of the, did some, some observations and looked at some of the um, um, artwork and displays within the school. Um, 
And a, a jump off point that, that got me um, interested in this partly as I was preparing to go into schools was uh, David Aldridge, who I think is also at this university, teaching at this university, um, posed the question about how should war be remembered in school and the lead up to St. Tino's. And he um, said that war should be, um, the horror of war is what should be put across. And educators should consider replacing associations with bright red flowers, pristine stone memorials and elderly men wearing medals with images or narratives of children killed or wounded in war. And this was something I had in my mind when I went into the school to, to collect data. Uh, I don't know if I should have given you a warning for David Cameron popping up like that, but um, he provides some of the context here um, about the um, centenary. And he made a speech at the Imperial War Museum in 2012 um, to announce that £50 million um, pounds were going to be spent um, are on these uh, commemorations where um, young people should be put at the front and centre in our commemorations to ensure that the sacrifice and service of a hundred years is still remembered in a hundred years' time. And we can see here already we've got um, the language being used is um, very much around the sacrifice sort of language and this idea of the national spirit um, in our schools. So there's quite a lot of um, language already being used in the central discourse around um, sort of this being a national thing around um, the people who, who sacrificed for, for us. He was also announcing that there'll be trips to the battlefields were going to be funded for schools. And, um, but with, within this project, I wasn't just interested in um, how um, how World War One was remembered, but also um, how um, other wars were remembered as well. The title of this presentation, Your School Needs You to Buy a Poppy, was um, inspired from this poster that was up on the Head of History's door in Alderfield School. And this, I was going in throughout the year doing interviews and, and meeting people and this stayed on the door the whole way through and I felt from this the message was clear that this is the, the iconic poster recruitment poster uh, your country needs you and this has been uh, turned around to your school needs you to buy a poppy and this language is very much based around kind of not a choice so much as a sort of imperative the point, the imperative voice, giving a very particular message out in the school. I'm just going to give you a bit of a history of the, the red poppy here and also the white poppy. So uh, the red poppy, they're sold on behalf of the uh, Royal, Royal British Legion, who are a service charity who have proclaimed themselves to be the custodian of remembrance. And they say um, our poppy is a symbol of both remembrance and hope for a peaceful future. Poppies are worn as to show support for the armed forces community. They deny this being political, although this has been contested by, by many people. And uh, there was, in 2016, some controversy because um, FIFA uh, banned political symbols being worn and whether the poppy was kept was political was, was brought into the forefront of public discussion and the Daily Mail declared this a poppy war and poppies are very much right in the centre of the, the national discourse um, it's very much if you don't wear one it's questioned to, to, towards the beginning of November you'll see politicians news readers people in the public domain wearing a poppy and I don't know if you remember in uh, 2018, Jeremy Corbyn was, uh, was criticised for wearing one that was seen as too small. So there's quite a lot of criticism if you're not seen to wear these uh, correctly. And the white poppy is um, seen as a, a 
alternative um, and um, to, to remember all victims of war. These are the three elements, remember all victims of all wars um, and all victims, a commitment to peace and a challenge to the attempts to glamorise or celebrate war. And in 2018, there were uh, 122,000 white poppies sold versus 45 million red poppies. So they're very much in the minority. Um, and sometimes people choose to wear one of each, so it's not necessarily an either or situation. And there are also black poppies for, for service people of colour and purple poppies for um, animals killed as well. But we'll just focus on these ones for today. So, I've just realised that I can do a laser pointer. So that might be quite useful for pointing at things. Um, so one of when doing my research, I um, focused on use the idea of peace and war from uh, uh, Galton, Johan Galton, who's known as the founding father of peace studies. And he did this triangle of violence and the direct violence here is um, something such as bombing, for example, and what's going on in, in Ukraine at the moment, you can see is direct violence. You can see the buildings bombed, the people killed. And that is what's quite often thought about as violence. But he also saw there were two others which are less detectable. Structural violence is when um, is when the violence is inequality within a society. So think about it at the moment, people using food banks and so forth. That is a form of structural violence. This is inequality. People are in poverty, causing suffering. But then there's also cultural violence, which um, kind of justifies the other two. You may see in the media all the people use food banks because they're lazy or think about direct violence. Now thinking back to Iraq and Afghanistan, these acts of violence were, were justified. And so the way Galton said it is um, cultural violence uh, makes the other two look, um, even feel right, at least not wrong. And there's a difference between a positive and a negative piece as well. So getting rid of just direct violence is a negative piece, whereas a positive piece would get rid of both of these two, which are lesser seen um, too. So when we're talking about peace in terms of, of um, peacemaking, then um, the positive and negative piece, hopefully you can see there are, are different. And the other term I've used is the um, idea of grievability by Judith Butler. And um, these are the ideas we've got here, whose lives are considered valuable, whose lives are mourned, and whose lives are considered grievable. And she's arguing that within war, um, you can see the division of the globe into grievable and ungrievable lives. So if we're thinking back again to say Iraq and Afghanistan, um, there was definitely a, a narrative there of um, who was being grieved. And when I'm using discourse, I'm using this more in a kind of Foucaultian sense about, uh, summed up by Ball, about discourse is what constrains or enables writing, speaking and thinking, uh, and under what statements things are considered to be the truth. So when we come to the red poppy remembrance discourse, um, what I'm arguing, and I'll be talking about different, give you some different data as we go through, that, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, that red poppy remembrance discourse, both within schools and um, further out, is that it's militaristic. We can see who are the people that are prioritised to be remembered in war. Um, so this could be who's remembered in the silences, as I say, and who's fundraised, who's being fundraised for. Uh, that there are nationalistic um, uh, messages uh, promoted through remembrance, and the links there are to fundamental British values, and that war is normalised 
and seen as, as natural. It's very much as well that soldiers are passive within this. And also that it's seen as, as not optional, that it's um, seen as, as uh, something that you should be taking part in. And all that these are, it's obviously difficult to separate out, but I'll be touching on all of them. Um, so the school, Alderfield School, had a garden of remembrance, and I'm not going to um, show you that in case it, it's sort of outing for the school, but it was based upon this uh, sculpture some of you might remember was up during the centenary um, around the Tower of London uh, called um, Blood, Sweat, um, Lands and Seas of um, Red. And... Um, and there's a description um, for Rota, the one in the school, um, on Alderfield Memorial, uh, wooden cutouts of World War One style rifles stood either side of the centre point, which hosted a wreath of poppies. Both sides of the path leading up to the wreath featured World War One soldiers' helmets. Lining this path was barbed wire. This would have been hanging, would have been at the top of the tre trenches, and hanging on this wire were religious symbols. Along with symbols of World War One, there was also a board displaying what the te head teacher described as photos of all the soldiers that were lost in Iraq and Afghanistan. And this brings the garden up to date. So it's not just representing a war long ago, um, as a project around World War One centenary may seemingly do, but it's also bringing Iraq and Afghanistan into the, the conversation, which were recent controversial um, invasions which created a lot of debate um, nationally and internationally and um, and one thing that was particularly noticeable with this was it was um, this school was uh, founded in the second half of the, the 20th century it's not like other schools which had you know, old boys teachers who were, were killed in world wars this was something that was created fresh as it were so they could have done this in a different way. This shows sort of the strength of the discourse that they continued working within this, this red poppy way. And that runs contrary to Aldridge's comment that I put at the beginning, um, where the, where the um, images of the red flowers have not been replaced. And um, another um, thing here was in the Garden of Rembrandt, they had sort of cut out of these rifles, as I said, but something that I noticed very much was um, this was alongside the images of, of soldiers killed in Iraq and Afghanistan. But these were the sort of rifles that those would have had. They don't appear on the memorial. Um, so in that way, war is seen as, as being historicised and the, the true nature of modern day war is not acknowledged. And these were the sort of... Uh, uh, wooden cutout um, symbols that were were on the um, barbed wire. Although quite interestingly, the participants talked about about the crosses rather than the the other ones. And this is a, a description of the event they had. So um, they had an um, event that uh, leading up where the garden was unveiled, and I'm just going to read out this description. Um, we had an absolutely packed hall with everyone from Key Stage 3 in there, historians, the GCSE and A-level historians in there, lots of local dignitaries, local councillors, the local MP, uh, friends of the school, and James, who is our site superintendent, who was dressed, he was in the Paris, served in the Falklands, and he dressed up in his army fatigue, came down and laid a big wreath. It was absolutely fantastic all in absolute silence at the end with five or six hundred people in the hall. So with this description, we can see who was the centre of the remembrance there. We've got the caretaker laying the wreath. And also I know that within this, uh, this event, there were also um, people from military, other military charities, sections for the military charities that they're then fundraising for very much that this wreath was was made of red poppies but interestingly uh the caretaker was not the only ex-service 
person within the school. There was, in fact, uh, an English teacher who I called Sam, who was an, an ex-serviceman, um, and uh, he then, when he left the army, he began to reflect back on the war and uh, joined an organisation called Veterans for Peace. He said that the um, the event was very impressive, um, but um, he he said uh, they'd asked me if I had some uniform, if I could put the uniform on and my beret and march up and lay a wreath. And I flat refused to do that. I see the sentiment they're getting at, but I couldn't. There's no way. And he went on to say uh, there was no mention of the enemy dead. There was no mention of civilian deaths. It was all remembering our brave soldiers. And it's a rhetoric about it that niggles a little bit. And what I found very interesting here is here we have a potential resource for looking at remembrance differently. This is somebody who has experienced war, who has been on the front line and who's got a, come out of it with a, a different opinion. This is the only teacher who has who has uh, been in the army. And this could have been very interesting to, to hear his views. He's, he shared them at other times, but within the remembrance parade, there could have been a, a place for him. And he also explained how he uh, didn't wear a red poppy anymore. And he tried, he'd worn a white poppy in the past, but um, had, had received criticism for it. And he says he now wears no poppy. And um, he says he's then able to open up a discussion with the young people about that and explain his reasoning. So people came into contact with him and talked to him. He was then able to explain, but he, he wasn't given the same platform as the other um, ex-service person. We also sort of go back to this idea of um, who is remembered and um, who is excluded. Um, so these were the, some of the messages that the young people have. So I was uh, one one um, time I was in the school on Remembrance Day and uh, the loudspeaker said, uh, remember what they have done for us and shape the future of our country. This is in World War One, World War Two, and many other conflicts. We'll celebrate a minute silence. And that was the you loudspeaker know, in the school. Well, afterwards, though, the history teacher said that she, she wasn't really a fan of the, the word celebrate there. And um, there were other uh, teachers as well. Um, Another one said, the people who have fought for us and died for us. You can think about conflicts now or conflicts before. Uh, so that was another message they got. And a third one, um, it's about people, these are, uh, was said before the silence, it's about people who went to war for us, for our country, and the people who have died. Although this teacher went on to, to say that it is up to them if they choose to do that or not. But these are very much the messages that the young people are getting here, um, that they're being really told who it is to, to be remembered. And the language again, we've got about being died for us, the future of our country. And this again is um, very passive language. We talk about people who have, have died for us, but not people who have killed. We don't, we don't use language which is that when talking about remembrance. And again, this is sort of a, a form of the cultural violence. You can see that we're not looking at uh, soldiers as perpetrators of, of violence in this way. And um, this is another message that was um, got. Um, and as I, I'll say a little bit more about uh, shortly, um, that they're, they're told that Remembrance Day um, is about all victims. This is what one of the, the teachers said to me. And when I asked for clarification, what was meant about that? Um, they said, you're remembering soldiers who have died in conflicts past and present. It's not just World War One and Two. it's about Afghanistan uh, and Iraq, which seems to go contrary to the idea of all victims. Um, so it could, it could be that students here are sort of getting some mixed messages about who it is 
who is uh, being remembered. And we'll talk about this a little more shortly when um, talking about remembering throughout the year. Just going to touch a bit more specifically on nationalism here. Um, many of you may know the um, got the fundamental British values that the the prevent uh, uh, duty ask schools to to um, promote. Got democracy, rule of law, individual liberty, and mutual respect and tolerance for those with different faiths and beliefs. And this is linked in not only in our school, uh, Olderfield, but um, also within other schools. But um, in this case, it's something that the head teacher said um, to me that um, in the interview, he said um, there are opportunities beyond the curriculum for students to raise funds to celebrate British values and acknowledge uh, on a yearly basis on Remembrance Day. Here we've got Remembrance being very specifically linked in with fundamental British values. And again, we then have this was in a school newsletter saying that uh, in their tutor groups uh, are made up of different faiths and backgrounds working together to create a poppy display um, and celebrate core British values. The sense of common belonging is a very powerful one. And this school was about 50 percent uh, white British students and about 50% those from a Pakistani Muslim background. Um, so here there, um, he's linking by linking the, the centenary and Remembrance Day in with fundamental British values. He's, the head teacher here is really conflating the act of remembrance with national identity and a particular type of uh, national identity at that. So with, in the ceremony I mentioned before, uh, Britishness is represented by a military salute from the ex-soldier playing British military music and what could be called arguably a, a nationalistic poem of the soldier by uh, Rupert Brooks. So here he, the head teacher is being very proud that he's being inclusive, but this inclusivity is, is based back into this Red Copy Remembrance discourse with a very particular um, sort of Britishness being acknowledged. Uh, within the school, um, there was fundraising um, for, for these two charities. There was uh, Blesma, the Limbless Veterans and the Blind Veterans UK. And uh, you can already see within the um, within their logos, we've got um, uh, flags, uh, British flags um, on there. And uh, on in Blesma, the um, description on their website is that they're uh, dedicated to assisting, serving and ex-service men and women who have suffered life changing limb loss or use of a limb, eye or loss of sight in the honourable service of our country got our country is there and blind veterans um, say that they believe no one who has served our country should battle with blindness alone and here is the, is the head was saying that fundraising is being linked into fundamental British values and in this way supporting military charities is seen as neutral and it's not seen as being something that's controversial around remembrance and the choice of these charities by, by the school shows us who is the focus of remembering. So say they're not fundraising for UNICEF or War Child to help children in war zones, for example, but onto these these um, these sort of uh, charities, which you could in some ways link back to the structural violence of Galton in that people who have gone abroad to fight are not actually then supported by the government. So you can sort of link it back into to that way as, as well. Um, and as I said, there are, um, this was, school was particularly interesting in that it was a multicultural school. Um, and um, what I found fascinating was the way that the uh, Asian kids were talked about within the school. 
Um, so um, what they were doing to raise um, funds for the two charities I just talked about was they were making poppies and selling them to, um, to put on the Garden of Remembrance. And um, the ones who raised the most won a trip to go and see the uh, blood slept, slept dance and see the red um, uh, in installation. And the head told me the two students that raised the most money through charity were both Asian girls. And that was but the trend of what you would anticipate there. So I asked him, what did he mean by that? And then he went on to say, well, that's me stereotyping. But what I imagine um, when I see events on TV related to remember, I don't see many Asian girls involved. Those uh, representing or laying wreaths. So I've not seen a research paper that says X percent of Asian girls that, but from where I look at it, I don't see them. It's great. It's very inclusive. So we've got again this inclusivity is is very much um, go going into to this uh, particular form of Britishness, and it, it seems though the Asian kids here are being particularly praised for their participation. That the whiteness of the other kids is not mentioned, and it seems that emphasising these students' activities almost seems to be um, sort of justifying their, their British identity by uh, complying. And the fact that it is mentioned how they participate almost indicates that there's a possible concern that they would not participate and not comply. And um, Crawford in 2017, uh, I've got all the references at the end, uh, talks about fundamental British values as to treat the supposed value deficit between the white British native over the non-native Muslim other. And this could be seen as a, an indication of, of this occurring. And this gets even more interesting when we think about remembering throughout the year. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and when and who is remembered um, outside of, of November 11th. And um, so a silence was held for victims of the attacks in Paris, um, which happened shortly before I started um, collecting my data. And um, this was something the head teacher said they did because it uh, feels big. And he said the students may have questions about it. What was quite interesting was one of my other teachers said that he had been bust into to bust it, bust into classrooms to answer questions because some of the teachers were worried about offending the Muslim students by talking about terrorism. And um, in 2014, uh, the students wanted a silence for civilians who'd been killed in uh, Gaza. Um, and um, a geography teacher uh, told me that he said to them that minute silence we held on Remembrance Day is for all people who have lost their lives in conflict. It isn't just for British servicemen. It's important that you understand that. But from what we showed in the previous slide about who's being remembered, it doesn't appear that that's been made clear to the, the students. So it's not surprising that uh, they wanted this silence, even though um, they didn't get to, to have it in the end. And um, Francis, who, who introduced at the beginning, um, talking about sort of securitisation of the British education system, uh, said the only acceptable Muslim in this discourse is an apolitical and depoliticised. And that seems to have been the case here, it celebrated for taking part in Red Poppy Remembrance, but it's seen that the uh, Palestinian civilians are not seen as grievable in the same way. I just want to show you about this, this being wider than um, Alderfield School. Uh, when I looked into um, Remembrance Day displays, these were some things I just looked on Google um, images. They weren't things I sort of dug about for. Um, but when I looked up sort of Remembrance Day displays, this was something a, a school had put together. Um, the British have got here, um, got British values here in the centre and the poppy reeds. Um, next one as well here, um, 
looking at uh, Remembrance Day again. British values is at the top, along with uh, Remembrance Day. So I was then curious, decided to look at uh, the displays that exist on fundamental British values, and up uh, popped some ones with poppies on. So again, we've got the poppies here, here, and again, so this is part of a national discourse which is um, linking into um, remembrance and fundamental British values. And I'd be really interested to, to do a bit more work on that and more contemporary displays of linking the two. And here's just a, a couple more. Um, so I thought this was a particularly interesting one here where we've got uh, respect those who keep us safe next to a poppy. So again, giving some very specific um, messages linking together British values and um, and red poppies. We've got sort of soldier here as well, along with the red bus and, and the queen. Uh, and finally, I, I found this one that I thought was very interesting. Despite there not being uh, an obvious poppy, we've got with what does it mean to be British? We've got army and Royal Navy there um, alongside the NHS and, and the phone box. Also found that um, Royal British Legion uh, uh, um, have, in their later teaching resources have linked together um, the idea of sacrifice between uh, people who who um, served during the, the pandemic and um, those who um, who fought for the country. And um, it says in the notes from the PowerPoint, these symbols remind us to take time to remember and and thank all the people who gave in service and sacrifice. And there has been work done around the language used around the pandemic and particularly this idea of, of sacrifice in terms of so teachers, medical workers who have been seriously ill or, or died because of it. Um, that this this wasn't a sacrifice. This wasn't something that was was given um, freely. And this is just going back. It's a good time to to look again at this this idea of needing to to buy a poppy, and it links through to this idea of students being good for engaging in the red poppy remembrance discourse. Um, so we've got um, here um, where the history teacher who told me that the students have been well drilled in primary school to perform the silence talks about everyone's really, really quiet. There's no noise making. I've been really, really, really good. I've not had to tell anyone off. And it's never been a problem. And RE teacher also said that we don't have problems with students refusing to observe the silence which does happen at some schools. So in this way, the problem is seen as people who don't observe that this is something that is seen as a, a thing that should be done. And again, by not dwelling on it, uh, as the top quote says, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, here, Red Poppy Remembrance Discourse is really in full force and not um, criticality. Where I'm talking about the silence. Um, and another way of sort of normalising it is that the language used um, in this discourse uh, within the school, various euphemisms were used, such as uh, giving life, uh, sacrifice, those who are, are fallen, lost, um, people who don't come home, paying the ultimate price. And as I told you before about the photos of those lost in Iraq and Afghanistan. And again, these, these are soldiers who have shown as having a passive um, role within within the within war. And just sort of finishing off here, um, this discourse, although it's strong, it's also, it's also quite fragile. Uh, white poppies, for example, cause controversy. Um, 
and red is seen as safer and less of a threat. And the, the picture on the left there is um, a school in Gloucestershire who received complaints from parents because they had white poppies on the reef and they had to, to uh, issue a uh, statement saying they supported the armed forces. Um, the critical discussion isn't undertaken, that it needs to be, the science needs to be done, if you agree with it or not. And those who could be remembered, um, it's not not considered, um, such as civilians and enemy, enemy dead. So to summarise, uh, Red Poppy Remembrance Discourse is sort of the correct and normal one. Um, it's militaristic and nationalistic. And this leads into this cultural violence where war is made to seem, seem as normal. And that there are missed opportunities on how remembrance could be explored in different ways. It would be interesting to hear that. And I've realised that I'm afraid I've gone on longer than I expected to. So.